Hi, I'm Dr. Isabel Marina Held, a postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian Institution and the Bard Graduate Center in New York City. In my presentation, I'll be talking about the history of the term nude to describe color and its application in everyday items from dress to cosmetics. In my work as a design historian, I'm particularly interested in the intersections of design, technology, fashion, science, and the body. The research that this talk is based on grew out of my work on the history of post-war plastics and their relationship to body shaping practices ranging from underwear to prostheses. Utilising an intersectional approach, I examined these objects through the lenses of race, gender and sexuality to explore how they shape the body and identity in different ways. I originally conceptualised and curated Redefining Nude as an exhibition at the Science History Institute in Philadelphia that looked at the representation of skin colour in everyday objects largely worn on the body. Today I'll talk to you about the history of nude colours in relation to a series of objects, many of which were featured in my exhibition and some of which are included in my forthcoming publications. In 2015, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary responded to hashtag Nude Awakening, a student-led social media campaign to rethink their definition of nude from, quote, having the colour of a white person's skin. The dictionary updated the definition to, quote, having a colour that matches the wearer's skin tones. This series of five chess binders by trans-owned company GC2B from 2016 exemplifies recent efforts to redefine nude. The company, founded and directed by Marley Washington, a University of the Arts graduate, specialises in binders that flatten the chest. Washington, who is a Latinx and black trans man, set up GC2B because he identified that, quote, the only binding options were uncomfortable and inadequate compression shirts designed for cis men. The binders in this image encompass the company's nude collection. It comes in five different colours, ranging from their darker shade, nude number one, to their lightest, nude number five. I was really struck by how the colour palette centres the darker shade as the inverse is often true. It's important to provide some historical background on the use of the word nude in relation to colour. According to historian Jill Fields, until the 1910s underwear was usually white, but then a different hue came on the market. Called flesh, the colour was a peach or pink tone, but whose flesh did this colour reflect? This limited vision of flesh colour persisted for decades, and in many cases to this day. Brassiers in flesh colour created a desirable nude effect when worn under fashionable sheer blouses, but only for those with lighter skin tones. As hemlines rose, flesh coloured hosiery followed, as did other everyday objects worn on the body like flesh coloured bandages. Throughout the 1930s, such products proliferated and the term nude was popularised to describe a similar pinkish beige colour and the coveted so-called illusion of invisibility it could create for a select set of light-skinned wearers. These early definitions of flesh and nude colours excluded black, indigenous and people of colour. In this talk, I'll examine that history and highlight efforts to redefine nude. Colour sample books from the 1930s demonstrate efforts to define nude, a recently developed term. In a book titled Colour and Design in the Decorative Arts, Elizabeth Burris Meyer, colorist and dean of the New York School of Fashion Careers, included nude in her 1935 list of colour names in common use in merchandising and advertising, with the description natural skin colour of a light red hue. This definition excluded darker skin tones and by omission arguably rendered them unnatural. In many instances, such descriptions of light beige colours as interchangeably nude, natural and neutral endured. 
Similarly, the Texarkana Card Association of the United States labelled a light beige fabric colour swatch as nude in their 1941 standard colour card. In the exhibition, I was unable to show the wide range of colours within this book, but I've included an image here. So, looking at this example, I was struck by how many colours were developed, named and standardised. And here you can see how I spread out the book across this table at the Science History Institute Library. And you can really see the vast, seemingly endless variety of colours that could be researched, developed and produced. Yet flesh and nude remained exclusively light and pink. Objects like these standardised colour cards did not offer nude and flesh as a series of colours to suit a range of consumers with different skin tones. These examples of colour standardisation informed industry as evidenced in foundation wear and hosiery. In 1940, for example, Sears in their catalogues began listing foundation wear, such as corsets and brassieres, as available in only light pinkish shades, tea rose or nude. Again, nude was presented exclusively as a single light pinky beige colour as opposed to a colour palette of different shades that truly reflected racial and ethnic diversity. This exclusion reveals the structural inequalities and systemic racism in which these colours were created. Established standardised colour practices were also applied to materials experimentation and research and development in this period. See, for example, this rare early pair of light beige nylon underwear. The year 1938 and the words wear test are inscribed on the waistband. This is particularly significant for two reasons. First, 1938 is the year that the DuPont Chemical Company formally announced nylon's commercial production to the press. DuPont promoted nylon as the world's first fully synthetic fibre and made of coal, water and air. Nylon became the leading artificial replacement for silk stockings. The second reason why the writing on the waistband is so significant is that it says wear test, indicating that it was used in a series of wear tests. This pair of wear test underwear was in fact donated to the Science History Institute by Joseph Lobosky, a lab assistant to Wallace Carruthers, the chemist accredited with inventing nylon. Carruthers directed a lab at the DuPont Experimental Station in Wilmington, Delaware. DuPont invested heavily in R&D and experimentation and this pair of underwear is part of that legacy. As the label indicates, the company wear tested nylons like these on machines that apply different tasks such as stretching, as well as with staff who reported on the experiences of wearing them. This is an example of an early pair of nude nylon underwear. The Science History Institute also holds a second pair of wear test underwear that is also of the same light beige colour. Museum collections, including those of the Hagley Museum, Science History Institute, Science Museum London and the Smithsonian National, National Museum of American History, hold early samples of experimental nylon stockings. These objects are also made of a lighter beige colour. It's important to contextualise the choice of colour of these experimental nylon items within the colour industry. In The Colour Revolution, historian Regina Blaschek provides a history of the people and organisations, what she terms the colour intermediaries, behind the phenomenal shift in the colour profession between the mid-1800s and mid-1900s. At this time, Germany and the US invested in the synthetic organic chemical industry, revolutionising the colour industry. Blaschek observes, quote, New artificial dyes and pigments enabled other manufacturers to reproduce virtually any colour, creating possibilities for great visual variety. 
Beyond Blaschek's analysis, it's worth emphasizing that while the science and technology to produce a wide range of pigments was achievable, it largely did not result in the industry developing hues for black, indigenous and people of color. In 1939, when DuPont debuted nylon stockings to the public, textile chemists and colorists were concerned about how established dyes would take to the new material. In response, the American Association of Textile Chemists and Colorists researched the effect of established dyes on nylon. They found that the first experimental dyeing of hosiery was carried out with the neutral dyeing acid colors generally used for dyeing silk hosiery. While there were some areas that could be improved on in terms of dyeing nylons, these could be remedied with minor adjustments, including dyeing temperature. The study of nylon hosiery and dyes concluded, our tests indicate that popular hosiery shades can be produced with acetate dyes comparable in fastness to light and washing with pure silk hosiery at present on the market. They also generalized the study to apply to underwear garments. Here, the American Association of Textile Chemists and Colorists assured its readers that established popular hosiery shades like pink, likely pink, nude, and flesh color dyes could be applied to nylons. The surviving wear test items held at the Hagley and Science History Institute show that when it came to creating the first nylon nude colour intimate variety was not a priority for DuPont's chemists or advertising staff. The development of these products replicated dominant beauty ideals and established design practices that centred on whiteness as the norm. While light pinky beige colours named flesh became increasingly popular for underwear in the decades following the late 1910s and resulted in usage of the word nude to describe a similar colour, in earlier decades the word flesh was used in cosmetic product descriptions. In the 1860s, companies similarly started promoting invisible face powders. According to historian Kathy Pice, white and red pink hues dominated the market. However, French perfumers and later American manufacturers began to produce a wider range of powders and rouges in what they described as natural shades. Cosmetic firms started advertising new colors such as brunette and flesh. And here in this image, you can see an example of a flesh colored powder with the word flesh um, inscribed at the top um, of the box. That were these, these new colors were marketed as being able to match the wearer's skin tone. But these cream and beige colored powders exclusively can cater to consumers with light skin. Anthony Overton, a lawyer with a chemistry degree, established the Overton Hygienic Manufacturing Company in Kansas in 1898. Overton noticed a lack of cosmetics developed for people of colour and in response produced a face powder line for darker skin tones. He ran his own in-house lab where he formulated and tested materials, emphasising their safety and effectiveness for his customers. In the early 1900s, when department stores did not stock items for people of colour, Overton, who was proud to operate exclusively as a black business, sold his products via a complex network of variety stores, neighbourhood drug stores and mail order. As manufacturers and advertising professionals paid more attention to the black consumer market, more white firms also entered the market seeking to capitalise on its profits. An example of this is Valmore Products, established in 1926 by Morton Newman, a Jewish Chicago resident who grew up in the Bronzeville neighbourhood. Newman had a chemistry background and created cosmetics largely aimed at an African-American market. African-American graphic artists Charles Dawson and Jay Jackson designed the labels which have since been on display at, muse at museums including the Chicago Cultural Center. Val Moore's beauty products specifically aimed at a black consumer 
face included hair straightening products as well as the sweet Georgia brown line that encompass face powders and shades including aristocratic brown and liquid makeup in beauty brown. In the early 1940s, when wartime access to materials was limited, purchasing nylon stockings was only a reality for those who could afford it and often were prepared to shop on the underground market where they sold for over $10 a pair, around $160 in today's currency. Some women who could not afford stockings took to painting them on. This included painting seams on their legs and covering their legs in liquid silk makeup to create the illusion of wearing stockings. One company offering uh, leg makeup at this time was Keystone Cosmetics in Memphis, a company founded in 1923 by Morris Shapiro and Joseph Menke, two Jewish chemists who made and sold many products aimed at an African-American clientele, including highbrow liquid face powder and leg makeup, seen here. In the summer of 1945, a fashion journalist writing for an African-American newspaper noted, leg makeup has been trying to take the place of stockings. Baggy rayon stockings have done much to skyrocket the liquid to its present acceptance. And here in this comment, um, the journalist is really commenting on um, the various types of materials that were being used to replace um, silk and nylon stockings during wartime. However, this trend of using um, liquid um, makeup on the legs was short-lived. Since their introduction in the late 1930s, nylon garments could be dyed in a wide range of colours but few companies explicitly developed and advertised products for people of colour. In my research, I've identified and written about a few exceptions. This includes a 1950s advertisement for a brand called Basin Street Nylons, as well as a Chicago-based company established in the 1970s called Sugar and Spice that celebrated the, mes the message of black is beautiful in its branding. In the 1970s, designer Zelda Wynn Valdez famously dyed pale pink ballet tights to match the skin tones of dance theatre of Harlem's dancers. In 2019, Freed of London and Japan's Chacot developed nylons beyond ballet pink to accompany their line of point shoes for dancers of colour. Products like these offer an alternative for some dancers who dye their hosiery and pancake their shoes with makeup to match their skin tones. These customised shoes were donated to the Science History Institute by Chanel Holland, founder and artistic director of Philadelphia's Chocolate Ballerina Company. When Chanel Holland donated her shoes to the Institute, I met with her and she shared the story of her shoes with me. Holland told me how important these shoes are to her. So as you can see, um, these shoes have been um, pancaked, which is a process where you apply um, makeup to the shoe to customise um, the colour of the shoe to match your skin tone. And Chanel has done this on the shoe, but also on the ribbons um, themselves. She wore them in 2016 when she launched her adult dance company and was working toward the premiere of the Chocolate Ballerina Company's first adult performance in 2017. Holland choreographed the performance titled Dreams Into Reality and described the emotions of dancing her dream into reality as she had always dreamt of one day performing on stage together with members of a ballet company for dancers of colour. These shoes highlight that while there have always been efforts to create restrictive norms and standards in fashion, design, science and technology, also there have always been efforts to push back against these practices. 
I hope that you enjoyed my presentation. You can also find out more about my research on the history, development and use of nude colours in design and science by visiting the digital version of my exhibition, Redefining Nude, now available on Google Arts and Culture. Thank you.